Hi everyone and welcome to the first FEMA live webinar. My name is Stephen and as many of you might have already spotted it with my accent, I'm French. Um, I am the chief executive of FEMA and I will moderate today's session. Before we get started, um, I would like to take a few minutes to go through some instructions uh, and practical details with you. So first of all, just a quick word about this new series of webinar. So FEMA will host five webinars throughout the year on FEMA's favorite topic. So please stay tuned. Uh, secondly, you can always join the conversation using Twitter and the hashtag is FEMA webinar. During the webinar, we would like really to hear from you. So don't hesitate to send your questions, share your comments, even challenge the ideas of the speakers by using the chat box that you can have at the bottom left of your GoToWebinar player. And lastly, we will also have live poll questions and they will appear and pop up right on your screen during this session. Um, at this point, I want to introduce briefly the topic and the speakers so that we can get to, um, right now into the content. So we will address today the issue of cyber governance, corporate governance, to ensure the cyber resilience of the organizations. And we see nowadays and more and more organizations rely on new technologies, uh, of course, for the operations, but also for their development. And it means that more and more, they are exposed to cyber attacks and cyber incidents, which basically uh, can cause great damage on their business and their reputation. So clearly, we see that the management of cyber risk goes far beyond the technical, the security dimension, and it's a matter of corporate governance. And today, we have two experts who will uh, present us uh, what they think can be the link between cyber security and corporate governance. Our first speaker is Philippe Cotel. Philippe Cotel is Airbus Defense and Space Head of Risk and Insurance Management. He's also a FERMA board member and chairing the Cyber Risk Working Group. He will be joined by Julie Kane, who is a member of RIMS, the American Risk Management Association, and she's Senior Strategic Advisor of the American company ETS, which, which stands for Education Testing Service. So, Philippe, Julie, welcome. And uh, before I give the floor to Philippe, I think we will have, we will start first with a polling question. So, Philippe, if you want to start. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tiffen. Um, um, hi to everyone. I'm really happy to, 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 to have the, this uh, webinar with you all. Uh, so let's start with the polling question number one, which is a, sort of a warming up and making sure that the, the system works. So uh, the question we would like to ask you all is, well, do you really think that we need the specific risk governance for cyber? Please, uh, there is not just one good answer to, to that question, and every answer is a good answer. It's just a matter of, of uh, a situation. So answer A, the answer is no. Um, answer B, the answer is yes. Answer C, the answer is uh, yes, but uh, only on, on a temporary basis. So uh, I think we're gonna leave you few seconds in order to to answer in order that we really have a, a gathering of, of enough uh, of uh, enough answers to to, to have some some uh, some data yeah indeed you should all see on your screen the the polling questions so you simply need to select your answer so and the answer is <laughs> ah, interesting. ah interestingly yeah uh, so we have a majority of people who are convinced that yes, we we need to have a specific risk governance for cyber. So we just welcome on board. Um, 
so maybe let's go through our, our views on that and um really when we would like maybe to to first of all identify the different dimensions of cyber risk clearly uh, and it's obvious for everyone there is some technicality on cyber and to some extent it's maybe for some just a technical issue but it's still a technical uh, aspect on that we all know about virus we all know about ransomware we know about hackers etc clouds so there is some technicality on that and clearly the technical aspect of cybersecurity cannot be denied however this is only one dimension of of managing cyber risk we have seen over over the the years uh, more and more a second layer of dimension which is related to regulation and compliance so public authorities all over the world in europe of course with gdpr with the nice directive uh, but also in china and the us have put in place a number of new regulations in order to address some aspects related to cyber <coughs> and very clearly for the companies this is a new dimension where they need to make sure that they are compliant to that to that new requirement and then there's a third dimension that even if you have put in place every technical aspect of security even if you have put in place all compliance to all the new regulations there is still a new dimension different dimension which is a strategic dimension related to the activity of your company if you are a service provider if you are an industry if you if you are just a, 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 a personal employee you have i mean by your activity as such you have a new dimension of exposure which uh, needs to be addressed and really what we really want to gather into governance is those three dimensions into some synthetic aspects so let's go to the next slide what do we really mean by governance of cyber risk it's it's uh, putting it's really not rocket science it's trying to put together the right process and the right resource in order to give to the board the right information in order for them to take the right decisions it's just as simple as that and very clearly through that process we will identify all the, the key stakeholders that have an influence on cyber risk because effectively cyber risk is a risk among others however what is specific to cyber is the fact that it's really transverse and it can affect all different uh, elements of your organization and so therefore you need to make sure that you gather all the different stakeholders together in order to have a global view of the exposure of cyber. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah we let's go to the question, question number two. The question number two is, well, how in your environment do you help top management to take strategic decisions regarding resource allocations on cyber security? So, Clearly, do you really help to take that decision from, from the top management? Answer A, yes, and you are involved both in terms of the mitigation strategies and you are involved also in the discussions relating to priorities and IT budgets. Response B, yes, you are involved, but only on the discussion for budget for IT. And response C, absolutely not this is truly an IT issue so let's see really where uh, you all stand on that maybe not a few seconds left uh, to uh, to gather the ah yeah. so we have the results what does it show oh. ah interestingly so uh it's uh, we have a sort of combination of people really involved in the mitigation strategy and the budgets and on the other side we have a, a number of people where this is purely under it responsibility and i think it's a uh, it's an interesting mix because it's uh, it's uh, shows that uh, there is really a, a variety of situations to 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 face so how have we tried to tackle this issue at, at in our in our group 
Of course, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So there's a number of, of elements that are recognized on an international basis, which were, of course, of value for us, both at OECD level, where they had to work on this uh, digital security risk management aspect, but also for enterprise risk management, where there were some model of line of defense, where basically, to make it very short, you got on the first line of defense the, 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 the business. On the second line of defense, if I, if I make it very simple, the support functions, who are both reporting the, to the senior management. And you had the third line of defense, which is related to the internal audit, who are both related to senior management and, and uh, a risk committee or audit committee. Of course, the working group that we gathered was a European working group gathering all the different sensibilities uh, among all the countries, but also gathering number of sensibilities in terms of industry sector and application, because it was important that the work that we try to do is recognized and applicable in different circumstances. So let's go to the next slide. Our proposal. Our proposal is relatively simple. It has, it's the principle to say that from a strategic standpoint, what are the scenarios, the catastrophic scenario that can really affect the company as a result of this digitalization process? And clearly what we really want is therefore to involve the business who are really at the heart of the transformation of the company and security. And in many organizations, these are silos and they don't really communicate one to the other. But we really wanted to put the business people in a situation where they would have to think what could go wrong, what are the situations that could really affect their business if they were on the other side, and ask security to challenge whether on those scenarios, which one are credible from a security standpoint. And this is a discussion where the risk manager has a role to play to coordinate this dialogue between those different functions in order to have some synthetic aspect and to give only key scenarios that are both credible from a business standpoint, credible from a security standpoint, and quantified financially. And then that's really a, a key aspect. But it's not only the role of this group. The group is also there to provide solutions, to help the top management to decide and therefore, that group who has put in place those scenarios of exposure, those catastrophic scenarios, will work as well on what are the proposals for mitigations. What are the actions that can really reduce the impact financially or reduce the likelihood, be it on the security side, be it on the process side, be it on the business side. And therefore, to give to, to, to top management those two sets of information. One is, okay, these are the key scenarios which can affect the company, and this is the amount which uh, you may face in such a situation. And also, these are the proposals for mitigation that you could put in place where you can allocate your internal resources in order to reduce such exposure to the benefit of the company. And that's really the, the, the key basis of this governance process. Next slide. And from the start, we really wanted to involve auditors. And why? Because uh, we wanted to, to make sure that the work that we are pursuing is not just single-minded and that we have also our partners, the auditors, who are really uh, also having a view on the, the evaluation of risks being involved. And what is the way we saw that, that collaboration really making sense and being a win-win situation? In fact, digitization is, is a risk which evolves very quickly because technology evolves extremely quickly. So we need to make sure that the decisions that are being taken by the top management to be implemented within the company are effectively achieved quickly. And so therefore, Putting in place controls that are auditable by design 
so that this relationship between the risk managers and the auditors are effectively at that point, so that the auditors have a way to be able to audit very quickly if there is a flow in the process and come back very quickly to the top management to alert if there is a lack of uh, uh, involvement or if the, the decisions are not effectively applied accordingly. And this is really a very important aspect to be efficient. And this is really the process which we have developed together in order to improve the cyber resilience of the companies itself. So next slide. We have another question. question. Number three. So this question is quite interesting because we would like to know on your environment, what are the barriers that you see within your organization in order to adopt a specific cybersecurity governance structure? Response A, because there is already a very strong governance structure in your organization and therefore it's not really open to change. Response B, because of the complexity of the organization, because there is some disparate business lines, because there is silos. C, because it's a question of people and politics. Or D, any other reason. <coughs> and and, and uh, really, please answer uh, sincerely to this question, because this is really interesting. So. Where do we see the results? Mm -hmm. ah. uh, <clears throat> effectively, uh, and uh, it's interesting to see uh, that complexity of organization and people are key elements that uh, we see where uh, you, you could affect the implementation of this governance. And I think it's quite wise. Mm. Well, thank you, Philippe. Um, well, if you have any other comments, please don't hesitate uh, to send them using the chat box. Um, we, so we've heard that cybersecurity really is a cross-functional issue, which requires uh, well, a cross-disciplinary team um, and a good communication between the technical and non-technical teams. Um, I now turn to, to Julie. Um, so Julie, you are working for ETS, uh, which is a company which delivers online exam and tests, um, yeah. among others. <laughs> um, and, and definitely cybersecurity is key for you. Um, can you explain us how you have put in place um, a cyber risk governance structure uh, to increase the cyber resilience of your company? Yes, thanks, Stefan, and thanks, Philip, and to Firma and Rims uh, for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, yes, my, my, uh, as we've seen and, and heard in our most recent poll, there are several uh, barriers that organizations feel that they may uh, be facing in trying to implement a cyber risk governance structure. So I'll tell you a little bit about our company and how we've overcome some of those barriers and how we've really made a cyber risk governance structure work for us. So first of all, ETS Educational Testing Service, we are based in, in Princeton, New Jersey in, in the United States. You may know us for some of our um, high stakes assessments, the TOEFL exam, the GRE exam. Some of you are, are, are nodding or, or uh, looking for your number two pencil. <laughs> it's, um, you know, they, these are very familiar products um, to many people. We, we do many of other, other things as well in the educational research and, and policy space. We are a global organization, though, though based in the U.S., so we are testing uh, just about everywhere in the world. Very data intensive because of our research focus, so we have a lot of personal information, the test questions and answers, obviously, and then many of the uh, results of analysis and long-term data studies. Very complex IT systems, real-time uh, delivery expectations, very heavily partnered. We have about 300 partners. Uh, like many companies do, uh, to help us to uh, deliver our business all around the world. So a as we talk about these things that, that, that are, um, are specific to our business, I would encourage you to think about your business as well and how some of these things may be 
through or, or maybe parallels in, 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 that you face every day as well. Um, and think about some of, some of the implications, right? So as a global company, you have legal and regulatory requirements, you have cross-border issues, you have data flows, you have different uh, contractual regulations, um, you have cyber threats to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. Right for us um, specifically, that resolves off results often in uh, attempts to uh, uh, get access to our test questions. Right prior to it, give somebody an unfair um, advantage uh, in in sitting for an exam. Um, there may be other threats uh, that that your business faces. And, and changing every day. Um, in, in our case, we also are undergoing transformational change, as many of you have, right? We've heard digital, digital transformation as as a buzz buzzword, or in you know in news media all the time. For my company, that means not only um, changing the way that we do our own business internally, right? So a lot of uh, you know people working remotely, a lot of of uh, online um, interactions similar to what we're having today, right? People bringing in their own devices, wearing all sorts of connected devices on, on their bodies or, or bringing them into work. Um, also uh, migration, wholesale migration to the cloud and, and cloud services as opposed to, you know, a historical uh, in-house infrastructure and, and systems that were much more under our direct control. Um, for us, we, we've transformed the way our business operates, which is, has included some, you know, massive organizational structure changes. So lots of changes within the organization. So, it, you know, it, I, I had to laugh at the, uh, the polling question highlighted people in politics, right? I mean, I think that's true in, in every organization. There are many different ways to perform risk management, including cyber risk management. But the, the powerful, most powerful aspect of this structure and this model is the bringing together of people, right? The bringing together of experts, the, the, the uh, uh, reaching across those silos toward a common goal and a common purpose. And uh, really that's where you're gonna get the value out of this type of, of a model. So think about your own company, some of the parallels as we go through. I'll show you a little bit about how we've structured our, um, our uh, cyber risk governance um, within the context of our organization. And we'll be interested in hearing about how you have structured something similar or, or may want to structure something similar in your company. Next slide, please. Thank you. So ETS is, has a number of separate organizations that are focused on cybersecurity in various different ways, right? We have three separate uh, security organizations, which you may you may ask yourself why, right? This is this is an evolution from again our um, historical model of paper and pe pencil testing to the digital online delivery, as, as Tiffen mentioned earlier. Right, so, but we've maintained those organizations because they are still adding value in terms of, of um, mitigating fraud, um, ensuring the integrity of our tests. Um, even though they're digital, they're, they, we still need them as part of the, the, the holistic uh, you know, uh, security organization. We also have the privacy aspect of, of security, right? Legal and regulatory issues. Um, the, the business continuity and disaster recovery. We include audit for reasons similar to um, those uh, Philip raised earlier, right? We wanna make sure that any control decisions that we are offering to top management are auditable, right? That we can have some, some assurance around the, the effectiveness of, of their operation and that we're building them in a way that they're easily, easily auditable. Um, we also in, include now in this group um, folks from the lines of business in the, in the new newly restructured organization. Those are mostly people responsible for our key products. We include HR, we include insurance, we include risk, um, and we bring in other experts as needed, um, depending on what it is you know, we happen to be focused, focusing on at the time. So these, these individuals, the leaders of these individual functions, while they're responsible for the processes and procedures in their day-to-day -day work and within their own um, you know, local area of exp expertise and managing the risk there, they also bring that expertise to looking at the company as a whole. And they, they come together as a security steering committee, which is led by our CISO, our Chief Information Security Officer, 
and we all work together to manage the cyber risk of the company. Next slide, please. We'll show you what that looks like um, in context of the broader organizational governance scheme. So you'll see the uh, steering committee right there in the middle, right? So there is the top down um, connection, the interface there, the enterprise risk executive committee, the audit committee is there, um, the board and, and, and president of the company are there. We also have the the, the uh, bottom up. Right? We have those local functions that I mentioned that are, are charged with managing risk within their own sphere, who have come together to form the committee. So we have both the top down and the bottom up, and and function together to determine risk exposures across the organization, and and provide guidance on uh, effective mitigation. That includes budgets. That includes uh, cyber insurance. Um, oversight of significant security initiatives and capital investments, right? So this is not only a, um, a, a risk management activity for our company, the way it's structured. We actually um, do provide some direct oversight of major capital investments, you know, where, where we're making huge strategic shifts in um, implementation of large-scale uh, large security controls across the organization. Um, we, we do uh, work to define policy that works ac across all of the different functions and to mm -hmm. respond to complex uh, security incidents in ac across functional. Right, so I, I would encourage you to just, just think a little bit about how such, an, such a function may exist within your own organization. You may not call it a steering committee or, or a governance structure, but, but how are people coming together within your organization to, to help each other to make the right decisions and the right prior priorities and to uh, support executive decisions when it comes to cyber risk? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So remember the proposal, right? So this is this is the proposal. So it, when we first started, started our uh, conversation here, I asked you to um, think about your own company and the parallels, right? So we'll look at the parallels now between the proposal and, and what we're doing um, in this case study, right? So you'll see that that we have an, a risk committee, right, which is the uh, Enterprise Risk Executive Committee in my company. The Cyber Risk Governance Group is the steering committee, the Security Steering Committee, right? And then our security steering committee is made up of representatives from the first, second, and third line of defense. So including audit, right, for the reasons we've discussed. And then all of the folks who are charged with making those local risk decisions and executing on, on security controls throughout the various lines of business. And um, just maybe I want to highlight a, a point. Uh, I mean, we were so delighted to, to, to have you, Judy, uh, and, and that's why we really wanted to share with you all this example, because really what we try to push together is not a one-size-fits-all solution. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. All yeah. we try to, to express is a sort of principles where on, on your organization, you need to adapt to your reality of your business, the reality of your organization. But here you have an example of a company in the US who has effectively developed this, uh, this, this set of principles also by itself and not just because of, of, uh, of uh, corporate rules or because it was financially efficient and yes. it was uh, driving the business in a much better situation than in the past. So basically, in that example, you see really what we really want to push is to be pragmatic, to be adaptive to your situation, to drive better efficiency for your company. Yes, thanks, thanks, well, that's true. I mean, there are really some key attributes that make this very, very powerful, and, and how you do it is going to uh, you know, really depend on, on how your business is set up and what works for you. If you're a regulated company, you might have a little more of a top-down mandate in terms of how you do it, right? Um, but, but either way, having the elements of, of this is really what's key. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how we came up with this approach. As you mentioned, really on our own, you know, uh, before we became aware um, of the model. 
um, and I was delighted to see, you know, it really validated, you know, when, when the model came out. Um, so, so in our case, this was very much a ground up activity, right? So we were we were initially quite reactive. Um, again, you may you may remember back to uh, to the beginning of the case where I talked about the silos, right? These the three separate security organizations and the, the local organizations that work independently uh, to manage their own their own area of risk. So we started to work together really because we had to, right? To manage incidents um, that, that were occurring that were maybe um, be becoming a little more technical or a little bit beyond what each of those organizations had had initially uh, been been charged with um, managing on their own. One one small example, again, as we mentioned, would be we, we were originally um, a paper-based testing company, right? So so we had the boxes of test booklets that were printed at a secure printer and packed in secure boxes and shipped it with you know tracking and we made sure that they were carefully cared for until the moment that they were unsealed and the, the, the test taker was able to sit the exam. Um, now everything is digital, everything's fast, everything's online, There's a, there are a lot more exposures. So if we did have an incident or we had, you know, a, a um, cyber related concern, it was very difficult for our, our historic test security organization to really know where to look, where to start, start to investigate that type of, of, an, of, of a, um, a concern. So they needed to bring in the information security folks, right? Then, then if it involved data, they may need to bring in the privacy team to determine whether there were any legal or regulatory aspects maybe um, that, that may need to be considered. And on and on, right? What does this mean to the business? How important is this to the business then to mitigate that control? So we started to work together again, in a firefighting mode, or in, in a very immediate tactical mode initially. And we, we, we found some trust and we found some common language. That we, and, and we started to think a little bit more proactively, right? So over the course of a couple of years, you know, working together and building that trust and building that collaboration, we then sat down and said, okay, let's really start to identify some key risks, prioritize them, and look at some controls that we can implement holistically that can take can really mitigate these and help the business you know to be able to move forward a little bit faster and to operate in this constantly changing and evolving technical environment so, so that you know, we were very successful in doing that really came to be seen by senior leadership as authoritative in in many ways um, on uh, you know the issue of cyber risk and we're able to evolve really as decision support for those leaders. So, you know, the business now would, would come to this cyber risk governance team and say, we want to do this, right? We want to go into this new market or we want to, we want to uh, uh, start to use technology in a different way. And we would say, okay, this is what the business wants to do. What needs to be true in order for that to happen without uh, exposing the company to, to too much cyber risk. So we would help them to formulate guardrails, which is what we call them, right? So guardrails or, or rules or, or controls that need to be in place in order for the business to then take advantage of the technology, right? So it's a little bit viewpoint rather than, you know, what can we control, control, control? It's, it's what can we control so that the business can take advantage of the features of the digital technologies that are available out there and that are so powerful for all of us to use today. So it's an interesting evolution. You might you might think about um, where you are on this on this evolutionary journey um, as a company and some of the um, activities that you might take um, as, as you're beginning to build that trust and build those relationships and those those, those people connections within your own organization. Um, if you're in the reactive phase you know, or if, if you really don't know quite where to get started, um, you know, start start across your organization for for act, opportunities to collaborate with your peers, um, and um, you know, move on from there. It, it's it's very interesting um, and, and and easy really once you start start to to look at at what could be possible to start to build those relationships and and really start to add some value for your. 
what, what is really fascinating in, in this journey is that when you start just by being reactive, you are very much technically driven. Uh, yes. And the more you move in the road of being predictive, the more you really stick to the strategy of the company. And again, from, a, from an efficiency standpoint, what is really interesting is that there is always for security a challenge to explain the return on investment on security. And to have this kind of, of scenario approach where you can effectively evaluate how much the investment, the resource of security would reduce the exposure of the company, this is a very powerful way to ease the decision process and to help guide the top management into taking the right decisions in the interest of the company. And so really, this is really the, 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 this journey which is really fascinating. Right. And that's another way in which this, this cyber risk governance structure can really add value, right? If you're if you're always in that tactical mode and always in that that control mode, it's very difficult to talk about ROI, right? It's very difficult to measure the you know the cost or the cost of the of of a technical control in and of itself. But if you look at it in the context of the business and enabling the business, it can be very very strong, you know. Um, indicator of ROI, right? It can, it can, you can really look at, you know, I, we invest this much money in the control, but look what it will enable us to do, right? It can really enable us to go into a new market or, 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 or gain, uh, you know, a new way of doing business that, that really makes us, helps us to be sustainable or whatever it, the objectives of your company might be strategically. So really, really powerful, really useful. And uh, I would encourage, uh, everyone to think about how they might uh, might it begin or, or continue on, on their journey using this type of a model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silly. And I think we have a last polling question. Yes. All right. So again, thinking about your own organization, what would be the most important thing for you um, in, in order to make a cybersecurity governance structure work in your organization? Right. So um, there, there are a number of selections here. You can select all of them. Um, top down support uh, from a board or, or top management, bottom up support or cooperation from your line, line managers and, and, and your individual businesses. Um, both top, and da top down and bottom up are equally important. Regulations, meaning someone externally tells you that you have to have this, some sort of an external mandate. Um, and then funding and resourcing um, as being another. So we'll give you a moment to think about uh, which of these may apply to your organization. And then we'll see what kind of, uh, kind of data we have. Yeah, so you have the questions uh, on your screen and you can select uh, the answer. So we should have the results. Okay, so again, a little bit more of a, a little even distribution, so everybody's uh, ticked something here. But it looks like um, the, the uh, majority are looking at both top-down and bottom-up support. Um, I, I would tell you that we have found that to be true within our company as well. And I would, I would further um, say in a state that if you have the top the top management support and, and some sort of a mandate from your leadership and you have that bottom up support, the rest of it will come, right? So you'll be able to get the funding for the things that you need to do because you will have the support of, of leadership, right? Um, you'll be able to get the cooperation and support from the folks who actually have to actually implement, right? Because you also have the top down support. So it's interesting that others are seeing this this as well a reaction Philippe to this uh, result well I, I can only share because uh, clearly just a, a top-down decision process cannot work if you don't really have the collaboration from the the business people in order yeah. to to work together in order to identify what is really of most importance for them so um, without that that uh, support from from the, 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 the business line, from the first line and second line of defense, you can't really get something efficient. Okay. We completely agree. 
And, and, and of course, once you have an adequate governance in place, you know your exposure, then you are better prepared, of course, to buy insurance. And that's why we, we wanted to add an, a last and final question about insurance. So, which is, do you take cross-functional purchase decision on cyber insurance in corporation business units and IT? So response A, yes, cyber insurance discussions and purchase decisions are cross-functional. Response B, uh, yes, cooperation, but final decision by insurance function. And response C, no cooperation, purchase decisions taken by insurance only. While we are waiting, any, any comments about, about cyber insurance, uh, Philippe? Well, I mean, Clearly, you, the purpose of this this governance approach was, uh, first of all, to 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 be uh, efficient and to help company to be more resilient. Um, again, no company in the world can set itself to be immune to cyber risk. There is, uh, I mean, no company or organization can do, can say that they will never have to face a cyber attack. However, what is really the key point is that to be able to be resilient to that situation is absolutely key for, for, for the value of the company itself. We strongly believe that cyber risk management is contributing to the overall value of the companies. And therefore, insurance is part of this overall process. So let's see on, on the results. Ah, good. Ah. That's encouraging. Interestingly, uh, yes, uh, very interesting because uh, the cooperation seems to effectively be uh, be there, and it's absolutely key. Why? Because um, the cyber insurance coverage only makes sense if it's uh, really uh, addressing the exposure that you have identified through this 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 uh, governance process. So uh, that's really the first point. The second point is that. Cyber insurance is a combination of technical triggers where you really need to make sure that security who is really the first line of defense who, who are seeing all the attacks are able to confirm that those triggers are making sense from their experience. But also you need the business to secure that the impacts related to that uh, triggers are effectively addressing their concerns. So it's really a cooperation that makes this this uh, purchase the most efficient one for the interest of the company. And uh, maybe effectively, so so quickly, just to 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 frame the the the, the, the documents where you, we have really tried to gather those uh, sort of uh, of approach. On the on the right side, you see uh, the the FEMA uh, report on corporate governance, which where you will really see much more detail on how to implement the principles that we have tried to to explain to you very shortly. And on the left side, we have also issued uh, just very recently a report uh, in cooperation with uh, with uh, the most European stakeholders, Insurance Europe and BIPA in order to help organizations to prepare themselves for this uh, purchase of cyber insurance. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you, Julie. So um, I will now take uh, the questions from the audience that we have received. And the first one um, is we regularly see businesses failing to include their key outsourced IT service providers in regular cyber risk disaster scenario planning. How businesses can effectively address this challenge? Maybe, Philippe, you would like to, to start answering this question? I think it's a very good question because uh, actually, um this is really a matter of concern and the the more we go into this digitization the more we really have to include that environment within the frame of of the exposure of the company and um that's why this this uh, governance group is absolutely key because you need to put the business people who are effectively 
connected to to that that uh, that world envisage the different scenarios where if they were on the other side of the table and they wanted to harm the company where would you put your attack in the most efficient way and uh, in that's that's in this respect that uh, probably including that will will be uh, the most valuable part from a practical perspective what i what i've seen work and what we've done in our in our own company is to really try to um, put those guardrails in place to manage that complex ecosystem. Right? As I mentioned, we have about 300 partners, but it, those partners have partners of their own and subcontractors and subcontractors, and they may be on, on a cloud service, and they may be using, um, ha even have APIs for small services that help them deliver their service, right? So you're not only needing to be concerned about your first level, uh, supplier, but all of those supplier suppliers, right? So what we've, we've tried to do is put guardrails in place to help the business to understand those risks and how those risks are, you know, can can magnify. And so we have we have great relationships and we have uh, put proactive processes in place within our contracting, within our RFPs, within our, um, our supplier management and, and invoicing and payment, um, you know, mechanisms. So that uh, we can we can constantly identify when these things are happening, right? Some little bit of it's follow the money, right? So if if the business can't tell you who all of their suppliers are, at least you can you have a way to go go back and, and identify any that may have been missed. But um, but putting rails in place, as I said before, what needs to be true, right? So the business wants to do X. That X probably needs some exposure to these, you know, a supply chain or an ecosystem suppliers so, so what needs to be true in order to mitigate that risk and some of the things that need to be true are making sure that you're doing risk assessments down that supply chain that you have the right contract in place and and that you have uh, some technical and IT capabilities in place to to alert you you know if, if there's something that you know may go awry with one of those downstream providers so it's really a layered approach and uh, again, that communication is key, and, and then that central fiber risk uh, governance structure to determine where all of those key, you know, trigger points uh, exist um, is, is really very helpful as well. Yeah, in fact, the supply chain we should, should be looked at as well and not forgotten, and definitely that's for sure. Um, uh, I think we have time just for one last question, and as we have a, an interesting one here. What would be the specific expertise you think to be necessary um, to have within the steering committee? Um, so, what, what would you, what type of expertise and what type of, um, I would say, representative should sit in this uh, uh, group, basically? Right. So, so for me, I can I can answer first, and then Philip, maybe you can answer more broadly um, based on on the, the model itself. But for for us, you are really two key kind of dimensions of the answer, right? So, the one would be someone who has expertise in their own local you know risk management function so if they're going to be there to represent for example privacy right then they should be an expert in in privacy regulation privacy uh, uh, design considerations privacy controls and expectations of, of, of uh, you know data subjects right um, so, so the same would be true for security right you need somebody who, who has you know deep technical expertise for insurance you need somebody who really understands cyber insurance and work it and, and that landscape, right? So whatever, whichever functions are important to your business and the way your business operates, there should be a representative from that function. The other dimension would be the level of the person, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean their, their title, but their level of influence within the organization, their decision-making, the trust that they have of, of the senior leadership um, within their own group and, and, and more, more broadly, right? So you, you want people who are trusted advisors, people who can think strategically, who, who you know, are maybe a little less self-interested than, than people might be, right? That tends to be, in our organization, people at kind of a, a director or a senior manager or maybe even an executive director level, right? So people who can make decisions 
um, who really understand the lay of the land within their own space, but they could also have enough um, under really deep understanding of the business that they can look across and help others make those connections. So that yeah. that's what that works for us. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of the model, I mean, were you thinking of any particular expertise? Well, yes, when we, we implemented that model, uh, it was interesting to, to have people on the business side who have really uh, the, the global view of the business and uh, be curious so, so that they uh, understand the challenge of putting themselves in the shoes of the attacker. And... Uh, explaining to them that it really maps quite well actually the situation where for um, the vast majority of the attack the attackers are in fact uh, are people that are, we know the business very well but not so much a technical aspect and in fact they decide the target and buy the resource the technical resource in order to implement that so therefore it's way more important to have people that have the, the global view of the business, be able to identify the, 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 the weakest point, the, the crown jewels of the business, and to have also people that are on the legal side, contractual side, be able to address not only the first party loss that the company may face, but also the third party loss that the company may face if there is some, some contribution from third party, from customers you have to indemnify, it, or, or, or contract that you may lose and, and these sort of things. So these are the contributions in order to make this scenario the most valuable. And on the security side, people that have the, a broad knowledge of the nature of the attackers and, uh, and the, the mentality of the attackers so that they can figure out on both scenarios which one are making sense from a mentality standpoint on the attackers. So that's how you can build a group where uh, effectively they will converge quite rapidly to some very interesting key uh, catastrophic scenarios that sometimes had not been identified in the past. Great. I know we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to, to, to emphasize one point that you made, which is that you don't necessarily need everyone to have very deep IT technical expertise, mm -hmm. right? You really just need people to be able to think about what could go wrong, what could happen, what could, you know, the technical can come later, the technical experts can bring that detail. But but people often ask me, you know, in order to um, really be effective at cyber risk management, how technical do you need to be, right? And it's not necessarily that you have to yourself be deep, deeply, deeply technical, but you need to have those relationships and that, that mindset and be able to, to bring in that expertise when you need it. Okay, so you don't need to be tech uh, savvy, basically. <laughs> It, it helps, right, to, to at least converse it and have a little bit of language, but you don't you don't have to be, you know, super, super technical. Yeah. <laughs> no no are required. <laughs> you don't have to be a hacker. Okay, so, um, I see that uh, we, we, we will have to close the webinar. So we haven't been able to answer all the questions that were submitted, but we will post the answer on Ferma website. And if you have additional questions, do not hesitate to send an email to Ferma, um, and uh, we would be pleased to also answer you. Uh, so I invite you to uh, visit Ferma website if you want to download the two cyber reports that uh, we mentioned during the webinar, and also to visit the RIMS website, where a lot of resources um, are also available. You will receive the replay of the webcast um, as well as the slides um, uh, tomorrow, basically. Um, I would like also to remind those of you who are RIMAP certified that they can log two CPD points for attending this webinar. And uh, finally, I would like to thank you, our speaker, for taking uh, their time to explain us and to share the expertise and knowledge. Um, and thank you to all of you for attending this webinar. Our next webinar will be in April, and it will be about applying ERM to environmental, social, and governance-related risk. And we will have the pleasure to have a representative from the WBCSD, which is a World Business Council for Sustainable Development. So thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.